Hi everybody, welcome to the last installment of the We Unlearn series on attitude and attitude change. Um, I'm sorry for the delay, but I have cobbled together some interesting pieces of research which I hope you all love. So to quickly recap, we talked about what is an attitude and what are the components of an attitude. So in analogy, basically, we have talked about what is a car and what is the components of a car. If you have not watched that video, I would strongly advise that you watch that video and the one where I spoke about why there is a communal flavor being spread over the coronavirus, taking into example the Nizamuddin case. Um, do finish those two videos before you come back to watch the final and third installment where I'll be talking about briefly about different ways in which attitudes can be changed. I reference around three research experiments for this and I hope you're able to apply it in your daily life. All right, let's begin. So the first theory that we can use to change people's mindset is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance was coined by Leon Festinger after having done a series of experiments where he found out that people, when they have stated an attitude or a belief, acted opposite to that attitude or belief, they experience some sort of discomfort. And in order to relieve themselves of the discomfort, they'll either change their behavior or they'll justify why it's okay. For example, someone have, might have a belief or an attitude that smoking is bad for health, but they might indulge in smoking, which means they have created a sort of dissonance in their head. And in order to continue indulging in their behavior of smoking, they will come up with a bunch of justifications such as it only causes ca cancer in older people or I only smoke one a day, it shouldn't make a difference or the air pollution already is going to destroy me so why just not so I can continue being destroyed by doing something that I enjoy, right? So cognitive dissonance plays in this way. It can also work in the other way, which is that the person actually changes their behavior. Uh, they might have an attitude that smoking is bad for health. And because this attitude is strong, they actually change their behavior and they stop smoking. So in order to shed more light on this cognitive dissonance part, which results in behavior change, I came across a paper which talked of how they used this method to increase water preservation in the group that they were studying in. This also uses, this experiment especially, uses this principle called commitment and consistency, which comes under one of the six principles of persuasion. Commitment and consistency means that if you have committed to something and it's in writing, right, you are more likely to adhere to it. Which is why if you see in most of Ivy League colleges or most of um, any other college or exam, they usually have this box, which is known as the honor code, where you get to write and say, I commit to not plagiarize the work, uh, I commit to not cheat off from my friends. When you commit to something in writing, you're more likely to adhere to it because it would otherwise generate cognitive dissonance. So going to this paper, what this paper did was this. So um, they created a group of people and uh, they basically started alerting them that, well, water preservation was not their strong forte. The group acknowledged that yeah, I have a strong attitude towards preserving water, but I've not really done much to preserve it. So the first dissonance was set in. In order to cement and strengthen the dissonance, the experimenters told this group that you need to go and talk to people in the campus and ask them to join the water conservation effort by taking short showers. And they committed to this on paper. This increased the level of dissonance that they faced. And at the end, the experiment had resulted with people who had already a positive attitude towards water conservation, did not display good behavior around it, actually reduced the number of times that took, they took a shower or reduced the amount of time taken to take a shower or wash their hands because they had experienced cognitive dissonance, which was made even bigger when they had to convince someone to uh, follow their behavior and their behavior clearly is not matching up to the conservation uh, to, to the prospect of saving water, right? So this is one way you can apply cognitive dissonance and one method of behavior change. So how do we use cognitive dissonance in our daily life? Mm, I can tell you from an example of mine. So when I'm at a table and someone has expressed a comment which is very problematic if you examine it through the lens of gender or equality and equity, 
I simply pause and ask the person, do you believe in equality and equi equ equity? And more likely than not, the answer is yes, because these are very core human values and theoretically and intellectually, we all understand it. And then I tell them that, well, if you do believe in equality and equity, the opinion that you just expressed is not matching up to it. And I give them two to three pointers as to why it's not matching up. Instead of just giving my opinion, I explain, decode their messaging to them. So that's the first layer of dissonance that I create. The second layer of dissonance which I create is by telling them, well, now that you know this, I'm sure you're going to change your value or you're going to change your opinion. And the reason this works is because I'm not putting them on the defensive side. So usually if you tell people that, oh my God, your idea is shoddy and, and you're such a bad human being and you have hold such problematic views, they're likely to go on their defense because everybody likes to maintain their identity and maintain their ego. However, when you pose it as something that you expect them to do because they are good people, they're more likely to want to do it. So these are two, this is a simple way in which I have used cognitive dissonance in my conversations with people and I have seen sometimes that this works. Behavior change is hard, you will have to engage with someone with a longer period of time for them to change and there are some other processes involved which I'll talk in the next part. But I hope this is one, this one way really works for small behavior changes which you want to see. Going on to the next part now.